Camps. This is our fifth Transparency Camp. We've had five over four years. It's going to be our best, don't worry. Um, and in terms of the numbers, I know numbers aren't everything, but I want you to appreciate that from our first camp, which had about 100 people, up through our camp last year, which had over 270 people, the numbers of people, 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 who care about open government, about transparency, and open data are literally growing. And I think that if you take nothing else from the people in this room with you, it is to show that we, our numbers are growing. That means our impact is growing. And what we can do together is going to just keep on growing. The first speaker is going to be Sunlight's own Kathy Kiley, who is the managing editor of our reporting group. Come on, Kathy. Okay. All right, am I audible? I'm a printer, so I'm not used to all this high-tech gizmo stuff. Um, I am the managing editor of Sunlight's reporting group. And uh, before I hooked up with the cool kids at Sunlight, I spent the better part of three decades in what many in this room might not so lovingly describe as the mainstream media. No hissing, please. Uh, for most of that period, I would have considered the speech I'm about to give you completely nuts. Back when I started my career, it was right after Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein had taken down Richard Nixon and made journalism temporarily cool, I thought the only place to learn reporting was in a newsroom, and the only reason to learn it was if you worked in one. That's how I did it. First on a college campus, surrounded by Woodstein wannabes, and then in my first big city room, where my teachers included a cop shop reporter who kept a pistol in his desk drawer, a rewrite man who kept a baseball bat under the desk, and a political writer who one year, after an extended meditation at a local saloon, decided to solve his Christmas shopping problems by buying his wife and his daughter the same shower curtain. Those were the days. So some of you might be wondering what a nice, high-tech, open government organization like Sunlight is doing harboring a hoary relic of that late lamented era. I mean, in a world where everyone's a publisher, on YouTube and Facebook and Twitter and Tumblr and now Pinterest, haven't we made journalism obsolete? For the sake of democracy, we'd better hope not. Far from being obsolete, journalism must now become ubiquitous, the Allen wrench in every citizen's toolkit. There are three reasons I've come to this conclusion. First, we all now live in a sea of information, not all of it good information. In an information age, we must become more discriminating consumers. To do that, we have to think like reporters do. What's the source of my information? How reliable is it? What's the motive for giving me the information? As one of our presidents liked to say, trust but verify. Or, as a veteran of any American newsroom will tell you, if your mother says she loves you, check it out. Don't get played. The second reason more citizens have to start thinking like reporters is that there aren't as many reporters as there used to be. Because of the economic disruptions caused by the technology revolution, the newsrooms we've traditionally relied upon for our daily information diet are trying to do a lot more with a lot less. And that threatens the quality of our news report. Exhibit A, the Philadelphia Inquirer, winner of this year's Pulitzer Prize for Public Service, just got sold for the fourth time at a fire sale price. Exhibit B, Copley News Service's Washington Bureau 
which a couple of years ago also won a Pulitzer for uncovering the graft that sent Duke Cunningham from Congress to jail, that bureau no longer exists. The third reason more citizens have to start thinking like journalists is to keep information democratic. Because of the collapse of the advertising model that sustained mass media, there's a very real threat that our brave new information society could develop a caste system with the highest quality, most thoroughly reported information available only to the elite. And the rest of us being left outside of the paywall with gossip, sensationalism, and propaganda, or with data that's understandable only if some high-priced commercial entity reconstitutes it for you. For all of these reasons, I'm proud to represent the Sunlight Foundation's reporting group. We are a mini newsroom tucked inside a powerful data machine. We are there to report and also to teach and evangelize the tools we use to do our work. Tools like Follow the Unlimited Money, our real-time tracker of campaign contributions, or Influence Explorer, which compiles corporations' histories of campaign giving and lobbying, federal contracts, environmental violations, and influence on federal advisory boards, all in one swell foop. Or our brand new Scout, which allows you to search the congressional record, the federal register, and the legislative records of all 50 states. Tools like these help journalists and citizens become better watchdogs. So does our training, like the McCormick Specialized Reporting Institute that my colleague Bill Allison ran last weekend to help more than 30 reporters figure out how to track the millions of dollars pouring into this year's presidential and congressional campaigns. We form partnerships with journalists and other like-minded organizations as well. Right now, we're working with a coalition of open government groups to put online the political advertising files that TV broadcasters won't. What the Federal Communications did yesterday was just a baby step in the right direction, and there will be a lot, lot more work to do if we're going to seize what may be our best opportunity to identify some of the sources of the dark money pouring into these campaigns. The hardest part of this effort is not going to be the technology. We have a lot of smart technologists at the Sunlight Foundation to take care of that. The hardest part of this effort is going to be the old-fashioned shoe leather part, recruiting the number of boots we're going to need on the ground to do the actual information gathering. So, if you live in or near any of the famed battleground states, we need to talk. So all the world is a newsroom now, and if we are all publishers, we all need also to learn to be reporters. It's not rocket science, but it's vital to democracy, and we at Sunlight are here to help. So let's have a great unconference. I look forward to getting to know some of you better and maybe recruiting you for the great craft that has been mine. Thanks. Thanks so much, Kathy. Now, I want to stop talking, and I want to introduce somebody who is an amazing person that I've met through Open Government Advocacy, who kind of highlights, um, Kathy talked in broader terms, brought up a lot of the journalistic efforts that we have in the greater field of transparency. But as everybody in this room knows, there are a myriad of fields that relate to the work that we do. And my friend Beth Sebian here journeyed down from Cleveland, Ohio, because although she has a day job that is not all about government transparency, let alone helping um, her home, Cuyahoga County, improve 
on all the open government steps and all the open data principles that it wants to enact. Uh, but that is what she gets to do in the evening. So I'm going to welcome Beth up right now. I am really excited to be here. Who else is? Yeah? All right. Uh, nine months ago, I found myself walking onto a stage like this at Cleveland State University. Um, and it was for an event called the Transparency Action Plan Summit, which was something I spent about three weeks organizing and had been inspired to, um, to, to get involved in following my, my time here last year at Transparency Camp. Um, there we go. When I walked up onto that stage, I looked out onto a crowd of about 100 people. Um, and they were there for the same reasons that I was, and they were there for the same reasons that you're all here today. And those reasons are that they cared about being a good citizen, and they saw that there were opportunities for us to do this kind of work better, for, for governments to be better, um, and for citizens to be, to be better, and for the two of those groups to work together to figure out how to do that. Um, I gave myself the task in, in setting up uh, in introducing people that day of explaining what open government is. And uh, as, as we're inclined to do with any profound ideas, I put it in a pie chart. Um, I will spare you the, the pie chart today uh, and distill it into two things that I think are fundamental to what, what this movement means. Uh, the first is about governments thinking differently about their role and how they engage citizens, um, thinking that the information that they accumulate and the work that they do is something that the public should have access to and that it actually is their obligation to provide to the public. And on the other side of things is the role of citizens, and I think it's, it's one that's equally important. Um, open government is also about citizens thinking that it is, it is their role to step up um, and take action. It is their role to walk into a door that an open government um, is holding open to them. And those two things work together to create a, a cultural shift um, that is underway um, and is moving forward because of events like the one we're at today. What was exciting to me about the event that we held was um, it was at first, when I was organizing, I thought it would be about open government, um, that we would be bringing together a bunch of people to talk about what it meant. Um, and by the time the weekend ended, what I learned was that the event itself was open government. Um, we were able to bring together citizens and elected officials and, pu and public officials within the administration of the governments that we were working in with in Cleveland um, and we workshopped issues that were important to our community. And that itself, I, f I learned, really embodied the, the spirit of what this open gover government movement is, is trying to achieve. I think it's also fundamental to what we're trying to do here today. Um, this is not about open government, this is open government. Um, I want to take a moment to recognize two people that are here that came from Cleveland here with me. The first is Jeff Schuler, who you'll hear from in a bit. He is a developer, he is awesome. Um, and he's been a, a great partner for me in the work that we've been doing up in Cleveland. Uh, the other is Jeff Mowry, who is the Chief Information Officer in Cuyahoga County um, and embodies the kind of uh, leadership and um, engagement that, that I hope to see in, in more elected officials. Um, the event that we held brought those two types of personalities together, uh, and we did some pretty amazing things, which, which I'm very excited about. Um, this idea of, of this being open government in itself is, I think, worth pausing um, to appreciate and to celebrate. Because I think one thing Jeff and I are very aware of is that we have a lot of work to do. Um, and you know, a lot of this is about changing institutions and cultures, and uh, none of that happens easily. It's going to require some stamina and some creative thinking, but I have no doubt that, that it, is, it is possible and it is in our reach, and we're going to get there by, by coming together like we're coming together today. Um, 
So I would invite you all to appreciate over the next two days what exactly is happening in these rooms that you're in. Um, that it is, this is about um, enacting open government, not talking about it. Um, and it's something that I'm very grateful to the Sunlight Foundation for taking a lead in. Um, and it's a reason I'm excited to be here. So I look forward to talking with a lot of you in the next couple of days. Thanks. We are now going to begin our lightning talks. They are five minutes long-ish. The slides advance every 15 seconds-ish. I will be timing, and I'm friendly. Um, and I'm going to let Beth introduce our first speaker. So I, I mentioned Jeff briefly. Uh, Jeff is a developer that I connected with about a month before our uh, transparency event happened in Cleveland. Uh, and he had been kind of fiddling with, with some open government-ish projects uh, before we connected. Um, and through, through the, the TAP project, um, really just dug in. And it's been over the, the past nine months, we've had a chance to work together and with the county and doing some pretty, um, starting some pretty cool projects. I think we have a sense that we are just getting started, uh, but, but the work that's ahead of us is, is pretty exciting and pretty important. And um, I'm happy that he's here today to, to share some of what we've been doing with you. So I'm uh, really excited to talk about Cleveland because I love Cleveland I, and I get to tell you a little bit about it. I'm going to set the stage for what Beth was talking about, uh, the, the TAP Summit that we put on last year. Um, so Cleveland is the county seat of Cuyahoga County and Cuyahoga is also the river that runs through Cleveland. Cuyahoga means crooked and we're going to come back to crooked in a minute. Um, but it's got a, a twisting history as well, um, our city and our region. Um, so, can't see it very well, but this is in the 60s when uh, the Cuyahoga River caught fire because it was so polluted. Um, this is when Cleveland was called the mistake on the lake. Be a little bit before that, we were the best location in the nation. So it kind of keeps going back and forth, and we've gone through a lot. Most, most recently, the, the foreclosure crisis hit us really hard, and it's, um, it's been a difficult process. Um, the city is still trying to come back from this. A lot of just economic downturn in general. Um, the Great Recession, all that. That is our ex-county commissioner uh, and his new friends, the FBI, who are taking him to jail. He um, w went down on 32 charges of like racketeering and other corruption-related things. So what we're, what we're doing now is um, coming back, renewal. This is an urban garden, and, and the idea here is that we're taking all those vacant properties from the foreclosure crisis and turning it into... Um, a local food movement. Um, on the political side, we have a new county charter. Uh, citizens last year voted in, enacted a new charter to restructure county government. Um, thank you. Um, to, to reshape the way that we're doing things. Awesome. Lightning. Um, <laughs> so, and, and that's our, our new county uh, executive um, through the restructuring who's, who he ran on sort of a ticket of reform and transparency and open government. So this has been what he's talking about. That set the stage for um, the party that Beth decided to throw last year, which was the Transparency Action Plan Summit. Um, you know, it was ripe for this kind of thing to happen. Um, so the, the summit happened over the course of two days, uh, about 200 people o over that weekend. Um, we had speeches and panels. The county executive ha gave a speech on transparency. Um, we also had, on the second day, breakout sessions where we got to, you know, work a little more closely with each other. Um, pilot projects happened around stuff like budget, procurement, um, public engagement, the digital divide. Um, that's our CIO, Jeff Mallory, that Beth introduced, who we're just really excited about all the, the county participation that we got. Um, about 35 elected officials and members of county government participated over those two days, um, which was pretty awesome, especially for putting on the, the organizing this thing in three weeks. My involvement was, Beth found out that I'd done some scraping on my own time of county foreclosure data um, to repurpose it, kind of scratch my own itch. So I came to the summit and talked about open data. Um, 
The TAP Summit had a lot of really great impact. Um, part of what I was involved with following that was continuing the open data thread, um, which I was a little bit afraid the way that everybody was talking would get bogged down in large organizations that they wanted to bring in. I also launched a, a civic hacking meetup. Just let's get some geeks together, um, try to get people uh, turned on to hacking for civic, um, in the civic space. And we also um, moved forward, continued that relationship with the county. They came to us with a proposal. They wanted to work on a mobile app for um, gathering customer feedback at county agencies. So we got those uh, 15 or so people together um, over the course of a month or month and a half and built a, uh, a mobile app, sort of an app. It's, it's a Drupal jQuery mobile based um, solution um, for the county for that purpose. So we're really excited about where the relationship um, with them will lead, and, and we feel like we have a, a really um, a, a potential here for a lot, and we're excited about um, what could happen. We're also excited, uh, I've been talking with the folks in Portland about Civic Apps, and they're ready to open source that and uh, contribute it back to the Drupal community and to the community at large for anybody that wants to build a, a data or apps catalog. Um, so that's pretty awesome too. Thanks a lot. Um, I hope to meet as many of you as I can this weekend. I'm here because I'm so inspired by the work that you all have been doing. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to this. Thank you. We are now back to Lightning Talks. Uh, only this time we are going to Georgia, the country, or rather Derek Dohler, our next Lightning Talk speaker, is coming here. Q Derek. Yay, everyone, welcome Derek. Derek joins us from Transparency International Georgia, where he is a self-described resident computer geek and specialist in using technology to advance open government. Okay, Gamar Jabat. Once again, one more time, Gamar Jabat. Very good, now you know how to say hello in Georgian for the 448 of you who um, didn't already know how to say that. Um, so as Lauren Ellen said, I'm Derek Dohler. I work at Transparency International uh, Georgia. And obviously, you've figured out by now that that's Georgia the country, not Georgia the state. Um, we're kind of close to Russia and Turkey and um, a few other small countries that you may or may not have heard of. Um, and I've been in Georgia for about a year and a half. Um, and one of the first things that I kind of wanted to find out when I got to Georgia was, okay, where's the blogosphere? Where's all the discussion happening online? Um, and what I fairly quickly found out is that uh, in the terms that we think of as a blogosphere, there actually isn't really a blogosphere in Georgia. Um, there are a few sites that uh, we would think of as blogs, um, but for the most part, you don't have a lot of conversation occurring on websites that, that we would think of you know, from the United States as being a blog. But there is um, discussion occurring online in Georgia, and you can probably guess it's happening on Facebook. So um, we'll get back to that in a second, but for now, I want to step back and just look at a few stats about Georgia. Um, the population of Georgia is about 4.4 million people. Um, and about 793,000 people on Facebook according to their ad um, data as of yesterday. So that's about 18% of the population on Facebook. Um, now, to compare that to the internet usage, um, internet usage in Georgia, there's about 40% of the citizens say that they use the internet at least occasionally, and about 60% um, don't use it or don't even know what the internet is. That's that 4% down there. Um, that's not particularly unusual, as far as I can tell. But what I do think is interesting is that back in 2006, when um, Facebook opened up to the public, that number of internet penetration was about 7.5%. So that means that Facebook usage in Georgia is probably one of the first things that people do once they get online, because actually Facebook usage and internet penetration is growing. So you actually have basically a situation where there's very little difference in some people's minds between the internet and Facebook. And you have things like restaurants that um, simply don't exist on the internet. This restaurant does not have a web page. All they have is their Facebook page. And there are plenty of businesses in Georgia um, that are like that. So this is not a talk about, OK, Facebook is changing the world. Facebook results in the Arab Spring, that kind of thing. Um, but what it is is I want to talk about um, what happens when you have a culture which basically skips all of the 
early 2000s. Um, they had none of that. You know, no one, a lot of people really didn't have internet until just the past four years or so in Georgia. Um, and so basically what they've done is leapfrog. Um, that's a term that usually gets applied to mobile technologies. Countries in Africa have um, simply skipped the landline phone phase and they've gone straight to mobile phones. And you have interesting cultural things that happen when people don't use the, the landlines there. So that's how I kind of view this in Georgia is they've simply skipped that. The effect on the Georgian political discussion um, because of this is that Georgian Facebook is extremely flat. That is, there are not a whole lot of barriers. People are pretty much themselves. So um, in the US, we had a, private, a more private version of Facebook. And as they've taken those privacy settings away, we've had to learn how to use this extremely complex website to add the privacy to Facebook um, that we're now missing. Can we hold on this slide for a bit? Um, and so, no, sorry, give me this. Yeah, um, in Georgia, they don't really have that. So let's look at an example. Um, this is a television show called Women's Logic. Um, it just debuted on one of uh, Georgia's television shows, and I'm not gonna go into exactly what the plot is, but basically some people found it fairly offensive. Um, <laughs> and so uh, there was um, a fair amount of discussion about this uh, on Georgian Facebook, and um, some people eventually decided to organize a protest in front of the television studio using Facebook. And um, what happened was this is a pro-government television station, and one of the major pro-government uh, news magazines came out in support of the television show, also on Facebook. So you actually had the editorial board of this news magazine acting as themselves, um, working, basically debating the people who had organized a protest um, on Facebook. So you have, this is the name of the organization, it's called Tabula, and then we have um, a protest here. So basically you have the leaders of these groups actually as themselves on Facebook, not you know, uh, debating using dueling TV appearances or press releases or press conferences or anything like that, but actually kind of going head to head on Facebook and having a direct debate. And that's something that we don't see in the U.S. as much. Um, in the U.S., we've got kind of, you know, people show up on television stations, they give their remarks, but um, direct debate between people of opposing viewpoints um, doesn't happen quite so much. So that's what I mean by having Facebook being flat. So what's the point of all this? Um, the point is, I like to look at this from the perspective of my 14-year-old cousin. Um, she has experienced in the internet and Facebook in a very similar way to Georgians. Um, and right now, she's interested in using the internet for other things, i.e. not pol politics. But in a few more years, she's going to be using Facebook and the internet and to have more of a cultural awareness. And people of her age now are going to be doing that. And so I think that we may be able to look at Georgia as kind of a preview of how these 14-year-olds um, are going to be using the internet, i.e. people who have never experienced anything but an internet that contains Facebook. And so maybe Georgia might be a preview of that. Thank you. Our next speaker is going to join us from Georgia, the state, because we're collecting them all. His name is Matthew Cardinale, and he is the founder and news editor of the Atlanta uh, Progressive News, and he recently won a state Supreme Court case that he is going to tell you about. Welcome, Matthew. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Um, I'm Matthew Charles Cardinale, news editor and founder of AtlantaProgressiveNews.com, which incidentally I found founded in 2005. It's an online independent news service, and um, Within the last few weeks, we celebrated our 1,000th original full-length news article. So I thought that was pretty exciting. Um, so this is how, okay, so the secret vote. Um, in February 2010, the City Council of Atlanta took a secret vote while they were on retreat having lunch. And the vote was about whether to limit public comment at committee meetings. And I wanted to know how the council members voted. That's really all I wanted. Um, I don't think that's too much to ask. So I asked the council, well, I, I, I requested the minutes, and the minutes didn't say how they voted, so I asked them to amend the minutes and showed them the law, and they um, had a different interpretation of the law and chose not to do that. Um, the city attorney prepared a memo stating that OCGA 5014-1E2 did not require it. I threatened to sue. They still didn't do it. I couldn't find an attorney. And when you threaten to sue somebody, um, you kind of have to do it, or else next time they won't really take your threat seriously. So I sued myself without an attorney. Okay. 
Um, it is difficult to find an attorney willing to take on open government cases. Um, even so, citizens should be able to bring these actions themselves for a lot of reasons. One is, no one is going to care about your case more than you. Um, I had a friend uh, who found a FOIA lawsuit online, emailed it to me as a template. I kind of used that as the template for my complaint, um, not, despite not understanding all the parts. So OCGA 5014-1E2 is a section of the Georgia Open Meetings Act. It was actually amended a couple weeks ago, but it says the vote in a non-roll call vote, the vote shall be presumed unanimous unless the minutes list the names of those voting against the proposal or abstaining. Okay, and we'll, we'll get into that a little more in a second. So my case was dismissed pretty quickly. Um, the city of Atlanta filed a motion to dismiss, arguing that I failed to state a claim upon which relief could be granted. Fulton County Superior Court Judge Christopher Brasher ruled Okay, it doesn't say the minutes shall state who voted against and abstained. It just says that you shall assume it's unanimous if it doesn't state. So, gavel, go ahead, assume it's unanimous. Thank you, have a nice day. The problem was the council had already told us that the vote was seven to eight. So we were actually being forced to assume um, a fraudulent um, thing. So, and I felt that that was problematic. Um, so um, I had an attorney who had been advising me in a non-legal non capacity, and he said, Matthew, you know, really, are you going to spend two or three years on this? You could set bad case law. Um, don't, don't do it. Just give up. Um, so that wasn't what I was going to do. Um, and I appealed, I appealed anyway, because I, I felt that the ruling was, was so inherently, fundamentally problematic, because when you read minutes of an official agency meeting, you should actually be able to assume that what you're reading is, is a truthful reflection of what occurred. Um, so I appealed to the Court of Appeals of Georgia, um, who affirmed the lower court's decision. Um, at that point, I went to the Georgia First Amendment Foundation, who even more emphatically um, encouraged me to give up. Um, and they said, you know, really, you're just going to waste your time. You know, the Supreme Court never, hardly ever, um, overturns something of this nature. Um, I went ahead and filed my petition for certiorari with the Georgia Supreme Court, and in July 2011, the petition was granted. Um, it was the 32nd petition to be granted that year out of over 2,000 petitions filed in the state of Georgia. Um, and in October 2011, I went before the Supreme Court of Georgia and argued my case, which was pretty cool. Thank you. And two months ago, in February 2012, the Supreme Court of Georgia ruled in my favor, overturning the ruling of the Court of Appeals. As a result, secret votes are now banned, judicially banned, in, in the state of Georgia. Thank you. Um, so, you know, city councils, county commissions, school boards, and other agencies, uh, you know, that come under this law, can't take secret votes anymore. They have to tell us who voted against or abstained, if anyone actually did. Um, this also advanced case law in a way that says that the act has to be construed broadly. And if, that is, if there's anything ambiguous, that it must be resolved um, in favor of openness and legislative intent, which is also openness. Um, another significance of this ruling is I think it really um, lets the citizens of Georgia know that they can use the mechanisms provided under the act um, to get justice, and even if you don't have an attorney, um, that you should just go ahead and do it anyway. Um, in addition, I asked the council recently to amend the minutes, and they adopted um, legislation doing that. So they had to like stand there and read into the record everyone who voted um, yes and no. So that was pretty cool. Um, and I worked with the Attorney General of the state of Georgia and the legislature to change the section of the law um, so that it now just says um, the names of those voting for or against shall be um, listed. Um, it took about two and a half case, uh, month, excuse me, two and a half months for that case to come back to Fulton County. Um, it's now back in Fulton County, and I'm in the process of um, going through discovery and getting the city to admit basically what they did and getting the judge to rule that they violated the law and enjoin them from doing that anymore. Um, I continue to receive quest requests from citizens all over the state um, with their problems, you know, their open government problems, whether it's open meetings or open records. Um, 
and uh, I have I have applied actually to law school. I know that's a little counterintuitive since I did so well <laughs> as a pro se litigant. But um, in order to really be able to help other people, I decided I would go ahead and do this. Um, but I also believe that citizens should not have to have a lawyer for um, everything that they uh, want to do to get justice under open meetings and under open records. Um, therefore, I would like to launch a website for the state of Georgia um, for citizens that teaches them how to file their own pro se lawsuits. And I hope um, at this conference to discuss this idea, I have prepared a workshop um, that, so I hope some of you guys get involved in that. Um, and in part, it's because citizens shouldn't have to learn by trial and error the way that I did. You know, why can't we all work together, communicate, and um, that way people can start with an idea of knowing what they have to do. Because um, the issues are too important. And if somebody loses on a technicality, you know, the citizens, oh, this is me. On the, this is us uh, and, and my supporters standing in front of City Hall announcing our victory. But I was just gonna say, um, you know, if you, make, if you lose on a procedural thing, the citizens don't know, oh, well, he lost on a technicality. You know, she lost because service wasn't perfected properly. You know, no, it's gonna be, oh, that case had no merit. So it's very important to arm people with the, some of these basic tools. This is uh, me standing in front of the Supreme Court getting ready to make oral arguments. And this is our Supreme Court. Uh, the woman in the middle is Chief Justice Carol Hunstein, who authored uh, the opinion. Thank you very much to the Sunlight Foundation. Um, I'm really, I think the Sunlight Foundation is amazing. Uh, you know, I came up and went to the office and I was expecting like a little couple cubby holes. And I was pretty amazed to see how big and how much, you know, they have going on, so. Um, and yeah, please let me know if you want to come to the workshop, I'll, we'll see you there, or at any point if you have any feedback or ideas about developing um, these online tools for pro se litigants. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks guys. Thanks, Matthew. This is going to be a great weekend because of all of you, so just enjoy. Cheers. Thank you.